Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name's Jen Goldsack. I'm the CEO here at the Digital Medicine Society, or DIME, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to our August Journal Club. Uh, Journal Club is always one of my favorite events on the DIME calendar. We try and create this intimate environment for you to be able to really interact with authors who are leading um, some of the most cutting edge, some of the most important research in our field, um, and today is absolutely no exception to that. Um, with Hero, Stieg and Paul, we have tremendous expertise on the line here to really dive into a conversation about how we can quantify the benefits of digital biomarkers, uh, specifically within um, the context of use of uh, deploying them as endpoints in clinical trials. This supports enormous amounts of work that we've been doing here at DIME. We've always sort of uh, instinctively seen the value proposition, but now we can quantify it thanks to this work. And I'm really excited for these authors to dive into their work with you. But for folks who may not have attended a Dime Journal Club before, um, I'll just flash up the next slide here so we can get you comfortable. We'll do some very quick housekeeping before I introduce today's experts. So first of all, full disclosure, um, we are recording today's session. Um, the good news about that does mean that the session will be available for you um, to access after the event, share with colleagues, um, alongside the slides that our colleagues are presenting today, and of course the manuscript upon which this entire conversation is based. The other thing about Journal Club is that we, um, we are going to hear first from um, the experts. They are gonna give us the behind the scenes look at the work that they have published talk us through the significance and importance of their findings, but we do want to have a collaborative env environment. So please use the chat function, drop in your questions as we go, and we will leave plenty of time for discussion. When we do get to discussion, I encourage you to throw your videos on and really engage in a conversation. We keep these events small intentionally, so you can really have some face time, um, some really good intellectual conversations with our colleagues here. So with that, that's enough for me. We've got a tremendous conversation on the books for you, important work. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, three of the co-authors co from, as I said, quantifying the benefits of digital biomarkers and technology-based study endpoints in clinical trials, Project Moneyball. Um, and Hero, I'm gonna come to you first and ask you to introduce yourself to everyone on the line. This is something I've had a little bit of visibility in for a while um, and excited for everyone on the line to get to know you. Great. I'm Hiro. Um, I work for Connexa Health right now, but this work was done when I was at UCB. Um, so like everybody else, uh, we try to um, push digital biomarkers and we always been asked the question, what is it, what's the value? So that's why we, dis we did this project. And uh, Stig Johan uh, provided the technical and mathematical foundation of this work. and. Um, uh, we worked very closely together and really I'm pleased to have Paul who led the SV95C work from Roche um, you know, to be with us. So um, I hope this is going to be a good session for all. Stig, you on? Yeah. Hi everyone, uh, glad to be here. Uh, I'm Stig Johan Wiklund. Uh, I'm working for a company called Captario. We're based in Gothenburg, Sweden, uh, where I work as the CSO. Um, Captario develops the, uh, the software platform and the methodology and concept that we used for the quantitative part of this work. I will be talking a bit more to uh, later in this presentation. Um, my educational background is a PhD in statistics, uh, uh, from which uh, role I worked um, for many years in a, one of the large um, pharma companies uh, in drug development. Fantastic. Paul, do you want to round us out? Yes, of course. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Streibos. I'm an advanced newer technology innovation leader at Hoffman La Roche in Basel, Switzerland. Um, as Hero alluded to, I've been leading for the last four and a half, five years almost now, a collaborative effort with two external parties that has ultimately led to the qualification of the first ever digital endpoint for regulatory use. Um, and I will obviously discuss this in a little bit more detail later as it has been the inspiration for Project Moneyball. Fantastic. Well, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And Hero, I'll go ahead and hand the reins over to you. Great, thank you very much. So first, let me put artificial intelligence on. Okay, we're gonna start. 
So um, I hope you have seen the Moneyball film. If you haven't, please do. Um, but let me start by saying this. We are technology enthusiasts. We firmly believe digital biomarkers will transform clinical studies. And because we believe, we push. But we get pushed back. We are told by clinical teams, innovation great, but not in my study. Go somewhere else and come back later when everything is proven. And we feel that's missed opportunity. So we wanted to make sure that we have a way of communicating why what we believe is meaningful. Um, and we know digital biomarker development takes time. So we wanted to make sure that we have this conversation early. So that's why we did this project. But perhaps we've been too enthusiastic. We've been perhaps too um, emotional and not numeric enough. Maybe we were like the you know, old boys in baseball. That's why we did this project. So I'm gonna quote the uh, Peter Brand in the film, but read it in our way. Our goal shouldn't be to buy technologies. That's not our job. Our goal should be to buy clinical trial success, clinical study successes. And in order to buy clinical study successes, we need to buy true responders. And there's an optimized study design we can afford, and that's our job to help the clinical study teams. So that's, that was our inspiration. And um, that's where we saw the similarity to baseball. So to start with, we simplified clinical study uh, in six elements. And I'm sure this is gonna sound obvious to you that digital biomarkers mainly contribute in two aspects. One is to improve patient selection and the other is to improve outcome measurement or endpoints. And when we do that, we have more true responders having the true target disease and showing relevant treatment response. And that leads us to smaller sample size, uh, shorter studies and higher probability of success. Everybody likes that. And with that in mind, uh, we created a model and we based our work um, on two borrowed biomarkers. One was um, that, or that scan measurement in Parkinson's disease. Uh, this was a um, great job done by CPP and the selection of um, Parkinson's patients in using that imaging has been qualified. And I, you know, applaud uh, the CPP team for driving that. And that was um, amazing. And we borrowed that uh, for patient selection. And for the outcome, we borrowed SV95C because there wasn't anything relevant available in PD. So we borrowed SV95C uh, as if it was for Parkinson's, but it was for only for modeling. And I'm really glad to uh, have Paul here to, uh, you know, so that he can explain what he went through and what he saw as an impact. Paul? Yes, thank you, Hiro. So um, I, I think you've said this, the scene very nicely, Hiro. It, it is really with the, um, you know, against the background of being unable to objectively measure disease progression in our patients accurately and precisely that led us to set up this partnership uh, some years ago now. And I should really acknowledge the, the two other parties in this, in this relationship. One is Professor Laurent Savet, who some of you may know, he's a pediatric neurologist working out of Oxford, 
And he really has been very interested for a long time in being able to better measure how his patients are doing on and off treatments. Um, and then the second uh, partner in, in the relationship is a, um, a small French technology company, which is actually anchored in the defense industry. And it, this company is called Cisnav Navigational Technologies. And Cisnav is a really uh, excellent partner to start with, but they're also really, really interesting to work with because because of their diverse background, they are not a medical technology company, but their technology is actually highly applicable to the medical field. The technology that they have can be best described as GPS-free geopositioning. And through the partnership, we've developed wearable technology that essentially contains this technology and makes it fit for purpose to monitor disease progression with eye accuracy and precision in the real world uh, in, in various patient populations, obviously. Next slide, please. Now, it's really important to acknowledge the technologies that we've used for this. So you have to recognize that you cannot just use a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or a smartphone watch, uh, smartphone uh, application, for example, to measure deep phenotyping of movement accuracy and precisely in the real world. It simply is not designed for that. So through the partnership, we started from scratch and developed uh, a, a novel wearable technology that is based on magneto inertial technology. Um, and the first form factor you may be familiar with, it's called ActiMyo. And we've now miniaturized that into a new form factor called Side, as in by my side, uh, that is now also suitable, highly suitable for pediatric uh, populations. Suffice to say, this, uh, this device is uh, technically and uh, analytically verified. It meets the, the necessary uh, data, privacy, and security standards. And um, it is actually optimized for clinical trial use. So typically, the devices are worn on the ankle. And in fact, it's best characterized when it's worn on the ankle. And that allows you to, uh, with high accuracy and precision, uh, uh, allow the deep phenotyping of ambulation in the patient population that is using the device. Um, what should be said in addition is that the technology is developed such that it allows the de novo measurement of each and every step taken in the real world. So it's again very different from other tech types of technologies, but it allows you to measure and characterize and in fact visualize every step, every stair climb, every fall event that the patient uh, is, is exhibiting uh, during the day. And we can measure that and visualize it. And from that, of course, you can derive a large number of variables. Next slide, please, Hero. So the end point I would like to talk to you about today is SV95C, which is short for stride velocity at the 95th centile. Now, stride velocity is obviously the speed with which you step. And because we are able to measure each individual step uh, accurately and precisely, we are obviously able to derive stride velocity with a, with a high accuracy and precision during normal daily living. Now, the 95th centile comes from the fact that if you plot all the steps that you take during a day, and you obviously find normal distribution of your steps, but it's in fact the 95th percentile of all of those steps that are apparently very highly sensitive to change and to therapeutic intervention. So it's the 5% of the fastest steps that are highly sensitive to therapeutic change and also to disease progression in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now, a lot of work has gone into this to characterize SV95C, and there is not enough time to go through in detail, of course, but just to give you a flavor of what SV95C looks like in Duchenne. First of all, you can differentiate Duchenne boys from age-matched healthy controls based on their stride velocity. There's a very nice separation, which is, of course, highly intuitive. Duchenne boys will lose their ability to ambulate over time, and that is translated into a reduced uh, uh, speed of walking. It's also sensitive to therapeutic intervention. In Duchenne, the mainstay treatment to preserve ambulation is typically steroid, corticosteroids, and you can, in fact, restore and, uh, and preserve the stride velocity of these boys by using steroids. The minimally clinically important difference as measured with stride velocity 95th centile is very similar to that seen in the six minute walk test, but also in the North Star ambulatory uh, assessment scale. And in fact, it correlates with those scales as well. Not one to one, obviously, but there is a correlation there which provides confidence that it is a relevant measure to use. 
Now, what is really interesting are the two last points here. First of all, in Duchenne, SV95C allows you to measure and detect a decline in ambulatory ability much earlier than if you were to use a traditional endpoint such as the North Star or a six minute walk test. Similarly, you can also detect the benefits of corticosteroids much sooner than if you were to use the traditional endpoints. Moreover, the loss of ambulatory ability as measured by SV95C actually precedes the loss of performance when compared to measuring it with the six minute walk test or the North Star. And that is seen on the right hand side here. So here we have three graphs. On the top graph is the SV95C as measured with the uh, site and ActiMyo wearable device on the ankles in meters per second uh, over time. So three, six, 12 and 18 months. And we compared it to the same measures using six minute walk test and the North Star total score. And in fact, you can see that by measuring SP95C, you can detect a decline in ambulatory ability as early as three months after using of the devices. Whereas if you use the traditional endpoints of six minute walk or the North Star, you have to look at these study, uh, study these boys for 12 to 18 months before you pick up a comparable effect. So SV95C is a more sensitive measure of ambulatory loss. Next slide, please, Hero. So all of these data were taken to the EMA and the FDA uh, back in 2017. And of course, you may be familiar with this story, but eventually SV95C was qualified by the EMA for use as a secondary endpoint in Duchenne muscular dystrophy for regulatory decision-making in pivotal trials. Um, we've also submitted it to the FDA. There we were adopted into the uh, FDA COA program, and this is still an ongoing procedure as we speak. This was such a landmark event that the uh, EMA actually uh, presented and published a number of articles themselves in order to highlight the importance of this qualification, as it was the first digital endpoint ever qualified for, um, for this purpose. Next slide, please. Now, the final EMA opinion is uh, probably available, so you can read it yourself if you like, but let me just quote some of the text that the EMA has put in there because it's highly insightful as to how they consider SV95C. So stride velocity at the 95th centile when measured at the ankle. So this is the first caveat. It needs to be measured at the ankle using a valid and suitable wearable device. So in the final opinion, there are performance metrics that a device needs to meet in order to measure SV95C for regulatory decision-making purposes. And this, of course, rules out uh, other types of technologies that are not designed for this purpose. It is used uh, and can be used as an acceptable secondary endpoint in pivotal studies uh, for regulatory decision-making. And it allows you to quantify the performance uh, and the ambulatory ability of patients directly and continuously in the natural environment. So it quantifies baseline performance, it monitors disease progression and treatment benefits. And in fact, what's really interesting is that the EMA recognized the value of this by stating that this is actually complementary to the traditional endpoints, such as the six minute walk test and the North Star, but also that it has the potential with further evidence to replace these traditional endpoints. And that could have a major impact on the trial design specifically for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, as you can see on the next slide. So what we typically do if we run studies in Duchenne muscular dystrophy is that we, we power the study on a traditional endpoint such as the North Star or the six minute walk test. Now the six minute walk test is a close correlate to the stride velocity endpoint, of course. So if you were to power a study on six minute walk tests and you use an MCID of 30 meters versus placebo, then you typically would end up with a study that contains hundred patients per treatment arm uh, and you would uh, require to uh, study these patients for 12 to 18 months, typically. Now, if you were to instead power the study on SV95C with its superior sensitivity, then you can actually see that the MCID is very similar to that of the six minute walk test. It's, it's about 10 centimeters per second, which equates to 36 meters on a six minute walk test. So it's very similar to that. But if you push that through the power calculation and you get a dramatic reduction in the number of patients that you would require per treatment arm to see a treatment benefit, 14 versus 100. This is a massive and significant change in the power of, uh, of this study, of course. 
Not only that, because of the increased sensitivity to detect change, you would also only have to run the study for three to six months versus 12 to 18 months. So this clearly has major impact on uh, the design or clinical development of new treatments for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Next slide, please, and the final slide. So here you can see what the benefit of SV95C on clinical development in, uh, in Duchenne is essentially. It significantly reduces the sample size and the trial duration. Therefore, it reduces the burden and it increases the, uh, the ability of patients to enroll into the study. Now, this is clearly very specific for Duchenne in light of the qualification, but Stig Johan and Hero have applied this whole concept to see if it would also apply for other indications where uh, you know, a highly sensitive digital endpoint could be developed as well. So with that, I would end here and hand over to Stig Johan. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul. Um, yeah, and as uh, Hero mentioned this, uh, in his introduction, and as Paul alluded to just recently, uh, the, the objective of the Moneyball project that's underlying this uh, article was to try to see if we could uh, develop a quantitative model that would enable clinical trial teams to uh, quantify the eventual benefits in a clinical trial in drug development of using big digital technologies. This slide shows some of the core components of that model that we developed. And I've used uh, for, for this slide and also for the next slides, uh, a graphical representation uh, that's called an influence di diagram that's often used in decision analysis and decision, decision quality analysis. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, shows as, as rectangles the, the choices or the decisions that need to be made, in this case by a clinical trial team. Should we use digital technologies? If so, what endpoint should we use? Do we use a digital one or a traditional one? Should a study population, should we, use, should we use a digital biomarker to enrich the study population? Those are the questions that we try to, to address with the model. The elliptic forms, uh, and as I mentioned here, is one of the core uh, assumptions that we need to make is the treatment effects. So the elliptic forms are assumptions or uncertainties in the model. We represent the uncertainties with the statistic called distributions to uh, describe the uncertainty and a range of uncertainty uh, for things that we don't know and that we need to make assumptions about. Having done that, uh, the elliptic form with uh, double contour lines are, here are things that we need to, to calculate to get to the eventual outcome. And uh, indicated here, the, one of the key things that we do calculate from our models is statistical significance, as here mentioned early on that we are use, using as a key metrics to identify then the eventual outcome, given is the hexagons here, the, the value uh, from the clinical trial and the value from our model. Uh, and that is in this uh, summary, whether or not the, the trial itself is successful. And we can measure that in terms of the, the probability of study success, the POSS. We uh, use the, this, this model then uh, and uh, apply Monte Carlo simulation on that, uh, meaning that we draw a, uh, a value from these uh, uncertainties, from these statistical distributions that represent uncertainties. And we calculate the, the things that are needed in the model and we calculate the eventual outcome, uh, whether or not the trial is successful or not. And we repeat that. And in our, the article, we repeated that 10,000 times. We do that, uh, we, we built the, the model and, and performed the project using uh, the, the platform Captario Sun that is developed uh, by uh, Captario, the company that I work for. You could also mention that at this stage that the quantitative model itself, uh, as represented here, uh, and the one that we use to, to provide the results on, that model is entirely disease agnostic. So while we were uh, inspired by uh, Parkinson's disease and inspired by the great work that, that Paul is uh, described to you on SV95C, uh, and, and uh, we're inspired by that to produce results. The model itself and the modeling uh, concept could be applied to any disease area or any biomarker or technology that you want to evaluate. So that's a key part. Obviously, there is more to our model than is shown on this slide. So if we go to the next one. Uh, I've added some more detail and flesh to the bone to the modeling concept, um, concept that we developed. 
this might look a bit uh, overwhelming. Uh, I'll try to guide you through it uh, piece by piece. So if we go to the next slide, we uh, see the first part of the, this model and that's regarding the treatment effect. <clears throat> so we need to, to make some sort of assumption regarding uh, what benefit will the treatment under development in the clinical trial give to, to the patient. They could be split up into uh, sort of typically as, as an uh, active treatment as compared to a control treatment, uh, could be a placebo treatment arm in the clinical trial. But also in the case that we, we um, <clears throat> where we would use a um, biomarker to enrich the study population, we need to make assumptions regarding the, uh, the treatment benefit in the positive subgroup that we hope is larger than in a negative subgroup that, of patients that we want to exclude by using this biomarker. So we go to the next part of the, the model. Uh, this indicates that um, while we make assumptions around the true treatment, the underlying treatment effect of the drug that we, that we develop, when we then run the clinical trial, the observed value for the treatment effect that we would get as an outcome of the clinical trial is not exactly the same as the underlying truth. And that's <clears throat> um, coming from the fact that in the clinical trial, as in the upper part of this box, we have a limited sample size. So we cannot uh, get, uh, get data on all the available patients, but only on the ones that are included in the trial. That together with the standard deviation um, between patients uh, included in the trial uh, contributes to what's called the standard error. And the standard error together with random variation uh, are the components that uh, devices how much the, the observed treatment effect in the trial differs from the underlying true treatment effect. And the observed treatment effect is the one that we can use to mimic the, the outcome in terms of statistical significance and p-value as the outcome of the trial. Because the next, the next part of, of the, the model, uh, and that is the, the one to the lower left in this box, where we uh, built uh, the the representation of what would happen in the clinical trial if we were to use biomarkers to enrich the study population, as, as opposed to allowing all the uh, all, all, all comers into the trial that um, uh, meets the general inclusion criteria. If we use a biomarker, and as long as that biomarker is not 100% accurate, we will not be 100% accurate in selecting only the patients from the positive subgroup but some will be misclassified, so we will also include a couple of others. The degree to which we do not uh, provide 100% accuracy in, in classification are given by the sensitivity and the specificity of the biomarker, but also by of the prevalence of this uh, positive subgroup that we try to, to get to. Those three components, the prevalence and the sensitivity and the specificity of the biomarker, uh, did we then use to, to calculate the measure of the positive predictive value? The positive predictive value given the proportion of actually um, truly positive subgroup patients that would be included in the trial. So that leads to the active, uh, actual study population in, uh, included. And uh, also in the next step, that would lead to what the observed treatment effect would be in the clinical trial. The more accurate the biomarker, the closer the, the, the observed effect is to the true treatment effect of the positive subgroup that we try to target. I mean, this uh, trying to, to represent uh, accurately or relevantly the, um, the mechanisms of, of, the, of a clinical trial using these technologies, we can go to the next step where we try to quantify what is actually a, a successful trial. That it would depend on often the significance of a trial, but also uh, the, the uh, clinical trial team could uh, decide on other decision criteria on, on what uh, constitutes a successful trial, and that would also be represented in the uh, modeling concept that we devised. The successful trial um, could be measured in, in terms of the probability of success, of course, but it also could also be converted into other metrics like uh, the, the possibility of having a smaller sample size required for the clinical trial or having a shorter study duration of the trial. And uh, here we'll uh, just in a minute or so give more detail of how that could look like in, as an out 
come from using the model uh, on actual data. But before, before handing over to, to Hiro uh, for the final slides, I just uh, want to mention the last component of this the slide. And this is an, a part that we only briefly alluded to in the article, but I will anyhow want to mention it. And, and that is that the, the modeling concept that we devised in the platform uh, allows for continuing beyond just what the, um, the benefits in the single clinical trial that we're currently running. Um, we also transform it into the, the benefits of having a successful entire drug project. If the clinical team knows and has some ideas of the design of the rest of the project and makes some assumptions with the commercial de department on the, the market opportunities for this drug under development, the study duration and the increase in the study duration could be converted into a shorter time to, to launch of this drug into the market, which will enable the uh, the drug development team to calculate other measures as well for the entire product, like the net present value or the return on investment. So with that as an uh, introduction to, to the components of the model that we developed, I hand over to Hiri for a presentation of, of potential results. Thank you, Stig Yuan. So here's the output. So the model produces a graphical um, output or this is a really interactive tool and how we incorporated scenarios was to uh, to create four scenarios um, either with enrichment with that scan or a study endpoint with what we call SV95C like in Parkinson's. I, again, this is all simulation. This is all hypothetical data. But um, what where I like to uh, draw your attention to is comparing the orange line, which has both technologies, and red line that does have neither. So you might say, you know, completely traditional study design. And with these assumptions, uh, the simulation has pointed out to the study size reduction, you know, sample size reduction from 620 subjects to 325, which is significant um, difference. But again, it's coming from the assumptions, not from the model. Model is just incorporating the two biomarkers and visualizing it. So that's one way to um, evaluate the impact of adopting biomarkers. Or, um, you could see it in, say, time to market. So it is really time to signal detection, but it's a, it's a, sh a shorthand for time to market. So if we could claim, or if we could see a potential of launching a drug, you know, bringing a drug to market 10 months earlier, who wouldn't like that, right? So this is what it allows you to see interactively. And what we hope to do was to prove uh, if it was possible for clinical sponsors and technology providers come together ahead of time and design um, the study, uh, you know, design the uh, protocol with in mind uh, the potential or realistic potential of biomarkers and you know compare different scenarios and make a joint decision which hasn't been done so we wanted to try out uh, if that was possible and here it is technically it's possible and uh, we published it so that everybody could try it out and we you know this is a prototype so we would love to get your input, everybody else's input to make it better. Uh, but, you know, we were trying to solve the fundamental kind of um, challenge of biomarkers needing time and money ahead of time. We cannot put bio, you know, digital biomarkers into a pivotal study, you know, six months before study starts, it's too late. We need to think ahead and Jen's nodding because this is one of the recurring themes and we were trying to um, help break that through um, from, you know, with a simulation model. So that's what this paper is about.
back to you, Jen. Um, this is absolutely fantastic. I feel like, you know, I've read the manuscript a few times here. You and I, and actually with Steve Gohan, sort of went through this still when it was in development and still feel like there's an enormous amount to learn um, and more sort of uh, abilities to tease out value as we go. Now, I, of course, have a laundry list of questions, but it's more important that we hear from our colleagues on the line. So, Colleen, you just put a terrific question in the chat. Are you somewhere where you can unmute yourself and pose your question live? Hey, Jen. Yes, I am. Hey, Colleen. Good to see you. Oh, hey. hey. Too. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Question going back to the, the DMD example, and I'm curious to understand how you determined or defined what magnitude of change would be clinically relevant for this new biomarker that you defined. And then the follow on questions would be, you know, how did you get buy-in from the medical community at large? And what body of evidence did you need to submit to the regulators to convince them that this was this could really get some traction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question. And, and in fact, um, let me start with the, the, the last question first, because uh, it, clearly there was no precedent for qualification of a digital endpoint. So the eventual evidentiary package that was submitted to the EMA uh, was essentially uh, something that was negotiated and that also ultimately was driven by the fact that we were limited uh, to a rare population, a rare disease. So the ability to generate large data sets uh, is obviously very limited and, and complex. Um, and so it was really a, a balance that was struck there. Um, so the, the MCID really uh, at the moment is, is based on uh, distribution-based methodology. Uh, and in fact, it correlates well with the six-minute walk test that you've you've seen. Ultimately, we want to uh, use anchor-based methodology, which is sort of the typical way of doing it. But because of the small sample sizes currently available, and also the lack of successful trials in Duchenne, we have not been able to get a um, you know an anchor in place uh, for that just yet. But that's work in progress, and there are studies ongoing where that will uh, where that will have sort of come out of. Um, the with regards to the uh, the medical community, uh, I think this is something that is really important when you develop new endpoints, putative endpoints, is to obviously secure the, um, you know, the knowledge that the endpoints you're interested in are clinically meaningful, not just to the physician, but, or, but also to the patients themselves and, and to the carers, etc. So um, for the shell muscular dystrophy, we have worked uh, very closely together with um, the main patient organizations, such as PPMD in the US, you will be uh, maybe familiar with that. And we meet regularly with patient organizations to provide them with updates, uh, also to get feedback on the, the technology itself and the form factors, et cetera. So, but clearly there is more to do. I mean, here I'll refer to the internal obstacles that we in pharma have with, with uh, you know, implementing these types of technologies and concepts. In fact, the, um, the barriers are, are, are actually extending beyond the internal environment here. Um, you know, ideally, you want to work towards getting this type of technology adopted as standard of care, uh, as routine practice uh, of the management of Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy. And then ultimately, you know, regulators and possibly also payers after that will will uh, support this type of approach, but it really is a you know a, a very significant effort to to secure that that commitment across all the stakeholders uh, because they will all have different views and different perspectives and look at different types of value out of this type of work. So uh, it's work in progress, and obviously having the qualification is a very important first step to uh, in terms of the credibility that this endpoint has. And um, yeah, it really helps the discussion with all the other stakeholders in that respect as well. <clears throat> I hope that answers the, the, the question, Colleen. Yeah, great, thank you so much. Fantastic, thanks Colleen and thanks Paul. And um, I'm gonna monitor the chat here, folks. Please do feel free to drop your questions in as we uh, guide this discussion. I want you to have the opportunity to chat with Hero Paul and Stig Johan, but I'm gonna follow on Colleen's question if I can actually. So you know, having the example of the 95th centile stride velocity, the support of that numbers around that um, was fundamental to this. The process that you use was to translate this into Parkinson's disease, where we know there's enormous unmet need 
for better measures, right? Better measures that are more meaningful to patients, more accurate. Accuracy is a is a highly charged word with a lot of statisticians on the line, but sort of, you know, uh, perhaps more completely uh, uh, capture the patient experience, so on and so forth. But then there's all of the trial success elements that you discussed that are quite frankly disincentives to the to the kind of work we need to be doing in Parkinson's. What's the vision that you guys have for translating this model or for folks taking what you've published off the shelf and doing their own work to say, look, in our business, this is the therapeutic area or this is the condition or this is the nature of the measure that we're interested in. What steps would you recommend to folks on the line who really want to build on what you've proven um, in terms of the ability of this model to be able to give indicators of value? Yeah, so for you know, for pharma environment, I think there are two general avenues. One is to use this model and this thinking for internal decision making. So portfolio decisions, management discussions, being able to articulate the values of uh, digital biomarkers and you know justify required investments. That's one. But I also think this is a area for um, you know pre-competitive and scientific collaboration. So we chose Parkinson's disease because that was an available uh, reference uh, point, but we didn't, you know, I was working for UCB and we didn't do it for UCB asset. We just made up a template for disease modifying drug. And this could apply to many uh, other companies, many other projects. And I think it would benefit if, um, you know, disease by disease or this, you know, therapeutic area by therapeutic area, um, people came together to, you know, build this on. So the model itself is uh, disease agnostic, uh, but it requires a lot of efforts thinking what is going to be the, you know, treatment effect of particular uh, drug class or how would a wearable device uh, category of wearable device would detect the symptomatic changes, treatment effects. And, you know, maybe this is an area where companies should come together. Um, and this could, you know, should be done between um, pharma and academic and, you know, technology community, um, you know, coming together. And that's why, you know, we wanted to make the model interactive. So I think there are several avenues, but I would be interested in learning what other people think where this applies. Maybe I can just add to that, Hero, and then that is, you know, as, as a company, Roche invests a lot in, in, in digital technology and endpoint work. Um, and, and the perception and the view that we have is that we do not compete on endpoints. You know, the, the medical field uh, in, in the indications that we're interested in is, is being held back by the lack of good endpoints and a good ability to measure disease progression and therapeutic benefits. So our partnership with CISNAV is really uh, based on that whole concept that actually, yes, we enable this to, to take place, but at the end of the day, this is not a Roche proprietary endpoint. We do not claim unique, uh, um, you know, proprietary access to this. This is really in the, for the benefit of the entire medical field and, and Duchenne in the first instance, but we are working in many other diseases as well uh, because they all suffer from the same problem. And um, yeah, so that that really is the you know why we're doing this, and it is ultimately benefiting everybody, hopefully. I could perhaps also add uh, to to that sort of general industry perspective that you mentioned, Paul, and also here, but also from the internal perspective of a drug development company, I think one of the success factors of the project Moneyball was that we had a small but focused team that came from, from different parts of the organization, primarily UCB, but also from us in Cryptario, where we have the digital technology competencies, but also the quantitative statistics that I brought to the table, but also people from the clinical trial team uh, area and joining forces from those three angles to, to this uh, I think is an important success factor in getting this uh, type of work off the ground. And the other thing I would say is that you know you really need to start with the right technology um, because if unless you're able to detect and measure 
uh, you know, the variable accurately and precisely um, in the right context of, of use, etc. It, it really is, is very difficult to, 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 to talk credibly about endpoints. Um, and this is where why we've invested so much time and effort with with CISNAV on on the technology development to make sure it's fit for purpose. So, you know, it may well be that stride velocity at 95th centile is clinically meaningful to Parkinson's. We have no idea. We need to do the research in order to establish that. Maybe it is another variable that we can measure in Parkinson's, like ataxia or small steps or tripping or you know the the vertical foot rise or anything like that. So, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but you know, it's comforting to know that at least there is one type of technology that is being recognized by regulators to be able to, you know, to collect these types of endpoints to the right performance metric. Um, but of course, a wearable is not, you know, the end of all. It, it, there are other technologies, um, you know, possible as well, and that that's work that needs to be done still. There's there's so much I want to jump on from this conversation, and maybe I'll take it in in two pieces. I think the first is how you underscore Hero uh, Steve Johan the importance of collaboration and being effective with this. That whether it was across groups at UCB and then um, within um, Captario as well, that was the the recipe for success here. I think here also reminding us that, you know, the model stands, right? And the question is for other therapeutic areas, for other concepts of interest, do we have sufficient information and data to be able to um, plug in those assumptions to be reasonably confident in, you know, how the model may indicate downstream value? Um, of course, now I'm thinking about, you know, what we do about this at, at, at DIME and increasingly, we are engaging in these digital measures development programs, all to your point, for exactly the reason that you said. And there's a couple of pieces that I'd like to tease out and maybe get all of you guys to give some feedback on is your statement, we don't compete on endpoints. I think that's been something that there's been, some people have been saying that for a long time, but I think there's been confusion about, you know, well then how do we make forward progress if there isn't competition, if there isn't the ability to do something like collect and, you know, get paid for IP, where's the impetus in doing this? And I actually think what you guys are talking about underscore exactly how we do this. It's very interesting that the EMA, um, and correct me if I'm misspeaking, Paul, but the way I understand the qualification is that it's not a full stack tech product qualification. There are performance criteria for the underlying tool that must be met, but there is the ability potentially to switch that out in a very modular way. Guys, yeah, and I and so I think that's it, right? We collectively rally around, and this is exactly what we're doing in our digital measures development work: is let's collectively agree on what's high value, on what's accepted by our regulatory colleagues, downstream our payer colleagues. And I think you guys, um, I think it was Steve uh, Johan, you brought up, you know, the market size and possibility, uh, and considering and contemplating that within the model you know, let's actually think about measuring what is most valuable to the industry and all stakeholders. And then the ability to compete comes from, do I have the best technology in order to do that? You know, if I am processing and handling the data, am I doing that in a way that has, you know, delivers it to the, the, the data scientists and statisticians in the most agreeable way and not in some sort of janky zip file? Like these are the pieces I think can make the difference. If you want to be a technology company, provision the technology for the trial in a way that is better. Don't compete on what you're measuring. And then I was thrilled to see you guys mentioned V3 in the manuscript. And I think that part, and um, uh, you sort of quite rightly, I think, articulate that clinical validation is actually the hardest piece of all of this. But I think what you've done further reinforces the importance of the V3 model and the modular approach, because you have the technology, you have the measure itself, but then we can translate this into other therapeutic areas by repeating clinical validation. Paul, to your point, 95th centile stride velocity may turn out to be enormously valuable to the Parkinson's population. We don't have to go back and determine the verification criteria of the tool. We know that, right? There's an efficiency here that can be gained too. Um, I, To the extent to which you guys think about this strategically, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts, Paul, Hero, Stieg. Perhaps oh, pick up on the things that, that you mentioned on um, looking uh, 
beyond the clinical trial into the market and the value that it could bring both to the company and uh, of course to the patients and the society then uh, of course it could, could be the case where you find it excellent um, biomarker uh, which allows you to to identify correctly a certain subgroup of patients that would benefit more than others uh, from uh, from uh, the treatment under development but if that subgroup is only one percent of the entire population is that really valuable uh, or uh, is that just a waste of resources should we instead uh, try to develop this thing for the other than 99 percent as well that might benefit albeit a bit uh, to a lesser degree but still some sort of benefit so a smaller benefit to 99 percent is perhaps more valuable both to the company and to the society and to the patients than a larger benefit to one percent so uh, and that is of course an consideration and a perspective that you can only get if you take the entire end-to-end -end perspective uh, into account. Yeah, so from a business point of view or the, uh, the principles we had was, you know, we, we wanted to uh, develop a model, but we are hoping to develop a model to uh, complement the V3 framework and the playbook, because this is really um, adding further justification um, for the investment and efforts everybody need to make. Um, when it comes to joining forces, um, probably the most pragmatic way forward is to find the common denominator areas of uh, common interest, kind of common denominators, um, and map out the disease progression or treatment effect in general. Um, because it's quite hard work to, for clinicians and scientists to, to imagine what it might be to, um, well, to imagine treatment effect of, of say, disease modifying drug in Parkinson's, which doesn't quite exist yet. So it's a lot of uh, collective scientific um, estimation people need to do. So uh, for that, I don't think it's a proprietary thing. I think it's a, it's a perfect area for collaboration. Then, you know, let the, you know, the best drug win um, at the end. So I think that would be the mantra, uh, you know, from our end. I really like that. And Paul, I don't know if you want to add anything. I think this, this circles back really nice to, you know, we don't compete on endpoints. Like the whole point here, here to the deep understanding of the natural history of a condition as measured by a digital measure. Paul, when you spoke to the evidence packet that you put together for EMA, you had to be able to do that. You had to be able to show how it performed against anchor measures. I'm certain you had to talk about, you know, what does within patient variability look like? What does across population variability look like in this measure? If we are all measuring something different, it is, you know, we're having a conversation about the business feasibility of this because we have to be able to invest in order to manifest this benefit for our organizations and for the patients. You know, we have to be more focused, we have to be more collaborative. And Paul, I don't know how this is affecting other sort of ongoing strategies that you might be able to talk about. Well, I mean, specifically for, for Roche, you know, we are we are very heavily invested in in finding better outcomes, you know, using digital technology. And it's not just wearables, there's mobile phone applications, there's virtual reality, digital therapeutics. We're, we're, we're covering many of these different um, sort of approaches. Um, but I think the wearable project is a little, it's a little different. It's also the most mature and the most advanced in the company in the sense that it's got qualification, that's, you know, the technology is verified and validated. <clears throat> so it, it is very different. And it's also developed externally, you know, with a partner, with two partners, essentially. So it is a different type of project within, within Roche. But the concepts apply, you know, here as, as they do in all the other projects we have is, is essentially that we, you know, we are essentially interested in being able to measure how our patients are doing better. Um, and that is not something that is proprietary to us. Um, in fact, it should never be proprietary. This is this is really benefiting the whole community and the environment, all the stakeholders that are working in this field. And we are essentially seeing ourselves as an enabler of this. And eventually we will have benefits from that, but so will others. And that is really, you know, 
doing now what the patient needs next. I mean, this is what we say at Roche. It is really in the benefit of, of for the benefit of the patient that we're doing this. And um, you know, the technology is is fit for purpose. We apply it across many different diseases that are associated with movement disorders, uh, upper limb and lower limb um, movement impairments. And we spend a lot of time, uh, investments, etc. Um, you know, running natural history studies. Um, running very specific studies to validate new endpoints and new diseases, not always with the purpose of qualifying them, because that really is the Rolls-Royce. It really is to get is. a better <laughs> understanding and appreciation of whether these endpoints are at least you know, clinically meaningful to the patient, and then we can use it maybe for internal decision-making. Yeah, so there is a proprietary element in that respect for, for a time, but uh, eventually all of this will get published, and particularly if it is qualified, then it will be you know, publicly available as to what the evidence package was and what the approaches were and you know, what the context of use and how broadly applicable the, um, you know, the endpoints really are. Um, so, yeah, it's a very interesting discussion to have because it is not something that... It's taken a long time at Roche to, to get to this point where actually, you know, there was a discussion. Why would we want to do this if ultimately our competitors are going to run away with these endpoints? Well, that's not the point. The point is to have better means to measure how our patients are doing. Um, I, Paul, I couldn't have said it better in terms of closing remarks there. You know, how can we do better at measuring what's most important to our patients and where we can gain positive externalities there through um, improvements in trial success, you know, that's a win-win. We're ultimately here to develop, you know, therapies that are effective for as many patients as possible. And in order to do that, we are going to have to generate new tools with which to measure. Um, but actually what we're measuring is not something that we should, we should hold close. We need to do better than that as an industry. Um, fantastic. Hopefully you guys can see my screen. I've thrown a slide up. Terrific. Um, well, Hero, Paul, Stig, Johan, thank you so much for one, your leadership on this work. I think the vision that you had, you know, we are, um, you know, back to the money ball analogy, right? We are here. Um, we aren't, uh, we're buying runs, essentially. What can we do to chip away at trial success to deliver um, better therapies for patients as quickly as possible? I think your vision here is fantastic. Uh, certainly applaud you on putting this out into the public domain. And if you don't think the cogs are churning over here at Dime about how we might be able to take this forward, um, uh, you, uh, I, I think you know us well enough that, that this is on our mind and I look forward to some progress here. So gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, for folks on the line, we do have a couple of upcoming conversations I want to brief you on. Um, first of all, and apropos for, um, you know, we're not competing on endpoints is we are launching the findings from our first uh, pre-competitive digital measure development initiative. So on September 8th, we will be announcing um, or, or, or making public all of the resources that this extraordinary team has been working on for the last nine or 10 months. And, you know, absolutely with sentiment in line with what we've been talking about today, we warmly invite all of you to join us. Similarly, we actually have um, a huge success that came out of our research committee. So um, uh, members of our research committee have recently published considerations for conducting bring your own device uh, clinical studies. Back to our conversation about taking a modular approach, this fits in really nicely too. So congratulations to our research committee. Um, and if you would like to join us for that conversation, you are warmly invited to do so on September 15th. But with that, we've done it perfectly within the hour. Hero, Paul, Steve, Johan, thank you again. Um, appreciate all of you on the line for joining us, spending some time with us today. This is an incredibly valuable conversation and look forward to continuing to push this great work forward.